Hi, my name is Michael Shapiro. I'm an assistant professor of medicine and radiology and director of preventive cardiology and cardiac rehabilitation. I'm also a cardiologist at the Knight Cardiovascular Institute at Oregon Health and Science University. And today we're going to be talking about cholesterol and triglycerides. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to define what cholesterol and triglycerides are. We'll talk about where they come from, their important relationship to coronary heart disease, and how we can manage them. So as you're probably well aware, um, cholesterol and triglycerides are a major risk factor for the development of coronary heart disease. And if you look here on this figure, you can see there are a number of risk factors that have been defined. And at the very top where it says dyslipidemia, this is talking about abnormalities in cholesterol and triglyceride concentrations in the bloodstream. So let's start off talking about cholesterol. So what is cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is a fatty organic molecule, and because it's a fatty molecule, it's actually not soluble in the bloodstream, which is primarily made up of water. If you think of salad dressing, oil and water don't mix. Well, it's the same thing with cholesterol in the bloodstream. So in fact, cholesterol and triglycerides, these two fatty substances, aren't flowing freely in your bloodstream. They actually have to be packaged in these particles called lipoproteins. The lipoproteins transport the cholesterol and triglycerides inside of them from uh, tissue to tissue in the bloodstream. Now we tend to demonize cholesterol. We think, it of, it, we think of cholesterol as this terrible thing, but in fact it's absolutely essential for life. Uh, it's found in all of your cell membranes, it's important in hormone production, it insulates the nerves for efficient nerve conduction. Um, so cholesterol is not necessarily bad, it's only a problem when it develops in very high concentrations in your bloodstream. So where does it come from? Well, actually the vast majority of your cholesterol is produced in your liver, about a gram or 1,000 milligrams per day. Now some individuals with uh, genetic conditions may produce even more of that, but on average about a gram per day is produced in the liver. The other uh, way we um, get cholesterol is through the diet. And it's important to understand that cholesterol is only found in animal products. So if you're uh, purely eating non-animal products, you really won't be getting much cholesterol in your diet. Now, another thing that's um, interesting to note is that it's true that if you eat too much cholesterol, that that can have some effect on the cholesterol levels in your blood, but by far and away, the more important dietary source that causes the cholesterol numbers to get out of whack is by eating too much saturated and trans fatty acids. And so therefore, if you're trying to make dietary modifications to help reduce your bad cholesterol numbers or increase your good cholesterol numbers, you really want to um, mediate and mitigate how much saturated and trans fatty acids you're eating. However, there are some foods that are extremely high in cholesterol that you're going to want to moderate. As I said, the liver is the major uh, producer of cholesterol. So of course, if you eat liver, chicken liver, for instance, that's going to have a lot of cholesterol. Egg yolks are full of cholesterol, and of course, full-fat dairy products are also full of cholesterol. The American Heart Association has um, specific recommendations for how much cholesterol we should be targeting in our diet. If you don't have known coronary heart disease, then uh, the recommended amount of cholesterol is about less than 300 milligrams per day. If you have known coronary heart disease or you're at high risk for coronary heart disease, such as having diabetes, then the recommendation is to obtain less than 200 milligrams per day of cholesterol in your diet. And just to give a tangible example of what 200 milligrams of cholesterol looks like, that's about the amount of cholesterol that's found in a large egg. So now let's distinguish uh, the types of cholesterol. There's low density lipoprotein cholesterol and high density lipoprotein cholesterol. I'd mentioned that the lipoproteins are the carrier vehicles of cholesterol and triglycerides in the blood. The LDL, standing for low density lipoprotein, carries cholesterol potentially into the arteries if it gets into very high quantities. And the high density lipoprotein, the so-called good cholesterol, can actually get in the arteries and clean the cholesterol out. And it's actually uh, involved in regression of plaque that we see in the artery. So you can think of the L in low density lipoprotein as standing for lousy, and the H in high density lipoprotein as standing for healthy. And if you look at the picture here on the right, you see on the top the normal artery, there's a nice, thin, clean wall in the artery. There's no fat deposits within it at all. Nice, healthy artery. Below, when there's too much LDL cholesterol getting into the artery wall, 
what happens is that starts to develop fatty deposits, what we call atherosclerosis or plaque. And over time, it will start to narrow the artery and, and can actually cause symptoms such as angina, chest pain, and even worse, could rupture one day and cause a heart attack. So the high-density lipoprotein, the HDL, can actually get in those fatty deposits and at times assist in removing that plaque and actually causing regression of atherosclerosis. Now, let's look at the relationship between the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and risk for coronary heart disease. This data is derived from the Framingham Heart Study, a very large prospective cohort study. And what you can see is, as the LDL cholesterol goes up, there is an increased risk for the development of coronary heart disease. And this has been replicated in a number of prospective cohort studies. So very powerful relationship. On the other hand, the high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, or the healthy cholesterol, has an inverse relationship with risk for coronary heart disease. So you can see in individuals who have very low HDL cholesterol, say 25, they have a much higher risk for the development of coronary heart disease than individuals who have normal HDL cholesterol, such as 60 or 65, so the opposite of LDL. What's interesting to note is that the uh, ability of HDL to determine risk is completely independent of LDL. If we look at the far left of this figure, at an individual who might even have a low LDL cholesterol, say 100, if the HDL cholesterol is also low at 25, those individuals still have a twofold increased risk for coronary heart disease, despite the fact that their LDL cholesterol is low. On the other hand, if we look at the right-hand side of this chart, with very high levels of LDL cholesterol, say even 220, if HDL cholesterol is also high, say 85, those individuals actually don't have that much risk for development of coronary heart disease. So the HDL was completely independent of the LDL cholesterol in determining risk. Now let's move from cholesterol to triglycerides. Triglycerides are a fat that's carried in the blood. And again, um, it's produced in the liver and also obtained from the diet. And just as we talked about with cholesterol, um, uh, triglycerides are not a problem at physiologic levels. The problem only becomes if they start to uh, increase in concentration in your bloodstream. They're absolutely essential for life and they're a major energy source for your muscles in particular. So the association with triglycerides in coronary heart disease is similar to that of LDL cholesterol in coronary heart disease and in fact this figure is taken from the Framingham Heart Study as well. And what you can see is as triglyceride levels start to increase the risk for coronary heart disease also increases. And here you can see with the red line, certainly when you get to triglycerides of above 200, we start to see the risk really amplify. And I'd also point out that there's a gender difference in the risk. The women, as represented in the white bars, have a higher risk associated with hypertriglyceridemia or high triglycerides relative to men. So we take that very, very seriously. And similarly, just as we talked about the independent relationship of HDL and LDL cholesterol in determining risk, we see the same thing here for triglycerides and LDL. So that even in individuals who have, say, a normalish LDL cholesterol on the left, less than 130, if triglycerides are elevated in the yellow bar, greater than 200, those individuals have increased risk. And certainly individuals who have both elevated LDL cholesterol and elevated triglycerides have really very, very significant risk for the development of coronary heart disease. So now this is a pretty busy slide, but I think it demonstrates a very important point. This is a, a, a meta-analysis or a, a study that combines data from numbers of trials, and here you can see 29 trials uh, involving 262,000 patients and about 10,000 cardiovascular disease events. And what they did is they compared the risk in individuals who had the highest triglycerides, here defined as greater than 181, versus individuals with the lowest triglycerides, here defined as less than 120. And you can see that overall, the individuals with the higher triglycerides had a 72% increased risk for the development of coronary heart disease events, such as heart attacks or strokes, relative to the individuals uh, who have lower triglycerides. So clearly, triglycerides are associated with higher risk for cardiovascular disease events. So ultimately, why are we concerned about cholesterol and triglycerides? This slide depicts the development of atherosclerosis, or plaque deposition. Plaque is uh, the um, initiation of fat deposition with an inflammatory response to that um, cholesterol and triglyceride deposition. 
And what you can see here is this is actually a very, very long process from the time that plaque development uh, is initiated uh, to the time that individuals either have symptoms or a catastrophic uh, coronary event, such as a heart attack, takes a very long time, generally years to decades. So we can see that over time, as cholesterol is deposited into your arterial wall, it starts to narrow the lumen. And if the lumen of your coronary artery exceeds 70% blockage, uh, then generally people will start to have symptoms such as angina, which is typically described as chest pressure, chest discomfort, um, chest squeezing, or shortness of breath when you exert yourself, or sometimes just uh, physical um, intolerance. Um, meaning that you get uh, tired more easily when you exercise. Um, even more important than that, though, uh, is the fact that um, even at lesser degrees of blockage, uh, one of these plaques can become unstable and explode, and then a blood clot forms on top of that um, ruptured plaque and can cause a heart attack, and that's, of course, what we're most interested in preventing. And I just want to show you a short video at this point to demonstrate um, plaque development and plaque rupture. The culprit responsible for your heart attack is called plaque. Plaques are fatty deposits that line the arteries that feed blood to your heart. Over time, the plaques enlarge and narrow the artery. A heart attack occurs when the plaque ruptures or explodes, causing a blood clot to form and totally close off the blood supply to an area of your heart. That darkened area can form a scar. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about the management of cholesterol and triglycerides. Fortunately, we have national guidelines that give us treatment targets. And as you can see at the top of this slide, for individuals who have coronary heart disease, or what is called a coronary heart disease risk equivalent, meaning uh, something like uh, prior stroke or an aortic aneurysm or carotid artery disease, diabetes, these all have high risk for future heart attacks and strokes, just as established coronary heart disease does. Then we're going to target very strict LDL cholesterol uh, levels. We're going to try to target an LDL cholesterol below 100. And in fact, um, in 2004, there was an update to these guidelines, which uh, gave providers the option to treat even more strictly to target an LDL cholesterol less than 70. And I would say the vast majority of providers at this time choose that optional goal of less than 70 for their highest risk patients, people with established coronary heart disease or coronary heart disease risk equivalents. And as you can see, there is a number of ways to achieve this LDL cholesterol goal, but I want to underscore the fact that we start with therapeutic lifestyle changes. And that is a three-pronged approach, including uh, optimal nutrition, weight management, and cardiovascular exercise. And of course, all of you that are in our cardiac rehab program, of course, are engaging in cardiovascular exercise, and I applaud you for that. If we can't get to goal, though, with just lifestyle modifications, we have a number of medications that can be very useful and effective at achieving the LDL cholesterol goal. You'll see that statins are listed first. We really put primacy of, on the statins for two reasons. Number one, they're the most effective at lowering LDL cholesterol. But two, and more importantly, the statin-induced LDL cholesterol reduction has been clearly linked with improved outcomes, less heart attacks, less strokes, and increased longevity. Um, there are other agents um, that we can consider uh, after statins, and they are listed here, bile acid sequestrants, azetamide, niacin, and plant sterols and stanols. Now here's a, a figure that summarizes what we've learned from the statin megatrials, the placebo-controlled trials, in really all swaths of patients, both primary and secondary prevention in people who primary prevention, who've never had a heart attack, and secondary prevention, people who've had a prior heart attack. And what this slide demonstrates very consistently and very clearly amongst the trials is as we use statins to lower LDL cholesterol, we see that there's a very significant reduction in future coronary heart disease events. And as you can see, when you get to an LDL cholesterol below 70, the risk for a future coronary event, such as a heart attack, is reduced significantly. I want to talk a little bit about statin safety because I think uh, this has been misunderstood, particularly by the media. Uh, number one, statins are extremely safe. Uh, this is a category of drug that's been very well studied 
and formally vetted in a number of clinical trials, specifically even looking at safety. They've been around for over 25 years. There's a large experience with this, and their safety record is really excellent. However, before starting a statin, blood tests for determining liver health are generally recommended. However, it's no longer recommended that we necessarily need to follow these liver tests once an individual starts a statin if the baseline tests were normal. In individuals who have some modest elevation in the liver enzymes before starting a statin still may be able to start a statin, but their liver numbers may need to be checked periodically while on the medicine. Now, it is true that some individuals can tolerate statins, and certainly the most common side effect are muscle aches and pains. We call them myalgias. And this is estimated to be affecting about 10% of individuals who take a statin. However, we have many strategies to reduce or alleviate the myalgias, uh, including going to a lower dose of the statin, changing to a different statin, uh, going to decreased frequency anywhere from once a week to maybe three or four times a week. Um, and generally, uh, when we use uh, uh, some of these strategies, we can get most people to actually tolerate statins extremely well. But for those who still can't, and there are some people who just cannot tolerate statins no matter what, uh, there are, as we listed before, some non-statin medications that can be very, very helpful. Well, what about treatment of high triglycerides or low HDL cholesterol? Our guidelines certainly make the primary aim of therapy the LDL cholesterol. And so therefore, we don't really consider the triglycerides or HDL cholesterol until after we've achieved the LDL cholesterol goal. However, we do know that individuals who have high triglycerides and or low HDL cholesterol, despite achieving their LDL cholesterol goal, do remain at risk. So sometimes we do use combination therapy and additional medication on top of the statin and lifestyle medications uh, to get to triglyceride or HDL cholesterol goals. So to sum up, high levels of LDL cholesterol and triglycerides and low levels of HDL cholesterol certainly put us at risk for coronary heart disease, heart attacks, and stroke. Fortunately, lifestyle modifications and medications can help to drastically reduce that risk. Statins, our primary medical therapy, are extremely safe, generally well tolerated in most individuals, and have a strong evidence base for benefit. And with that, I wish you all good health. And if you have any questions in the future, please feel free to email me. You can see the email address at the bottom of this slide. And I thank you for your attention.